Uh, We're continuing in James chapter 2 tonight. So as you see the verses on the screen, we're starting at verse 8 in James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favouritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of God. did experiment with PowerPoint this morning, but it didn't um, quite work out the way that I'd prepared it on PowerPoint because our computer doesn't have uh, work on PowerPoint anymore, different system here. Um, so I don't know if I'll be experimenting again on that. Uh, just for you younger people, this is not to, in any sense, kind of Um, marginalize, discriminate, we're talking in discrimination this evening against the older folk who are here this evening, but for some of you younger faces that are spread around, what I'd like to do with you, not tonight, I'm going to give you a week, but maybe next week after the evening services, just to sit down together in a group and to talk about our evening service and to get some input from you on our evening service. So I'd like to do that with all the the young people and just to hear from you. And uh, you might have some ideas or some creative things that we can do with our evening service. So we open to that. Um, We have purposely not focused on having a youth service because we believe that everyone should be able to come to every service we have here at a church, young, old, doesn't matter. But we do also want to make sure that we are hearing from you and that you have input into the way in which we uh, do our services. So you've got a week to think about it. You've got a week to pray about it. And then in a week's time, we'll gather together and have a chat together. Uh, Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful for all that you have done for us. We are here not because we deserve to be here, but because you have shown us grace and love and compassion and mercy. You have revealed yourself to us in such a powerful way that you have wooed us to yourself by your love. And we have come to you not because we are good, not because we are deserving, not because we offer you anything. We come to you because you have drawn us to yourself. And you have made clear to us who Jesus is. And we thank you for our Savior who is so precious to us. And we ask this evening that we might once again just be able to hear your heart to us. Help us not to think, oh, I wish so-and-so was here. But help us to hear what you are saying to our hearts. And help us to have the courage to listen to the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit where he convicts and give us the grace to make the adjustments we need to make for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A lady in a faded gingham, I don't know what a gingham dress is. Does anyone know what a gingham dress is? You see, ladies know. There you go. So you've got some ignorant male here. He hasn't got a clue what a gingham dress is. Anyway, am I saying it right? Gingham. Okay. So keep that thought in mind. Okay. So it's got, you know, the square for the men, you ignorant men. Okay. Um, And her husband, dressed in a homespun threadbare suit, 
stepped off the train in Boston and walked timidly without an appointment into the president of Harvard. You know Harvard University? Harvard's outer office. The secretary could tell in a moment such backward country folks had no business at Harvard and probably didn't even deserve to be in Cambridge. She frowned. We want to see the president, the man said softly. He'll be busy all day, the secretary snapped. We'll wait, that lady replied. For hours, the secretary ignored them, hoping the couple would finally become discouraged and go away. They didn't. And the secretary grew frustrated and finally decided to disturb the president, even though it was a chore she always regretted to do. Maybe if they just see you for a few minutes, they'll leave, she told him. He sighed in exasperation and nodded. Some of his importance obviously didn't have the time. Some of his importance didn't have the time to spend with them. But he de and he detested gingham and homespun suits cluttering his office. The president's stern face with dignity strutted down toward the couple. The ladies told him. We had a son that attended Harvard for one year. He loved Harvard. He was very happy here. But about a year ago, he was accidentally killed. My husband and I would like to erect a memorial to him somewhere on the campus. The president wasn't touched. He was shocked. Madam, he said gruffly. We can't put up a statue for every person who attended Harvard and died. If we did that, the place would look like a cemetery. Oh no, the lady explained quickly. We don't want to erect a statue. We thought we would give a building to Harvard. The president rolled his eyes. He glanced at the gingham dress and homespun suit and then exclaimed, A building? Do you have any earthly idea how much a building costs? We have over seven and a half million dollars in the physical plant at Harvard. For a moment, the lady was silent. The president was pleased he could get rid of them now. The lady turned to her husband and said quietly, is that all it costs to start a university? Why don't we just start our own? Her husband nodded. The president's face wilted in confusion and bewilderment. Mr. and Mrs. Leland Stanford walked away, traveling to Palo Alto, California, where they established the university that bears their name, a memorial to a son that Harvard no longer cared about. You can judge easily characters on the outside, easily to inform opinions based on what you see without realizing what lies beneath. And James wants to continue this theme of discrimination. And what he wants to say is love is colorblind. Love doesn't make distinctions between people. Love doesn't look at the outside of a person. Love doesn't form judgments on what it sees. But love, rather, is extended to all without exception. And it's extended in the same way to all without exception. Love loves because it's love. And it's a supernatural love that comes down from on high that is invested in the people of God who have been blessed with supernatural power by the work of the Holy Spirit who has come inside them and transformed them and made them into what they were not and equips them and enables them to love in a way that they couldn't love if it was just natural love. You see, for you and I, it's easy to love the ones that love us. It's easy to love the ones that return our love. But when it comes to loving the awkward people, the difficult people, the people who rub us up the wrong way, the people who don't fit into our social circles, the people who look a little bit strange, who speak a little bit strange, that's a different story altogether. And the only way that you and I are able to do that is by being powered by the Holy Spirit from within to love as Jesus has loved. And so James wants to say to this church that he's writing, or this group of churches he's writing to, is he wants them to understand that if they operate on the principle of the love 
that comes from God, all people in the fellowship will be loved equally. No matter who they are, no matter what their background, no matter what they look like. And let me ask you this question. Who would not want to be part of a church like that? That knew when you walked in the door, no matter how strange you were, people would embrace you and love you. That's Christianity 101. So firstly, I want you to notice love's motivating power Love's motivating power removes discrimination. Verse 8. Love's motivating power removes discrimination. Verse 8. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. What does James mean by the royal law? Now, there could be a number of things that James uh, could possibly be talking about, and I'm not going to go through all the alternatives lest we walk out of here confused. But rather, to try and give you the essence of what James is saying is that the royal law is the royal law of love. James is speaking about a certain quality of love. It's the essence of what true love looks like. He uses the term in order to make the point that love your neighbor is the supreme overarching law that governs all other laws. All of them fall under the umbrella of love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in order to remove the discrimination, James is encouraging this church to put into practice that law. And it's nothing new. Leviticus 19 verse 18 reads, Do not seek revenge or bear grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Jesus then repeats that command. And he says in Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine, 39, and the second is like it. The first thing is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And then when you go fast forward to Luke chapter 10, verse 25, and I won't read the verses through to verse 37, look them up for yourself, you have Jesus defining what that looks like. What happens in Luke 10, 25? Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. We all know it. And Jesus has a man coming to him. I'll read the first part. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Fair enough question. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? Don't you love it when people ask Jesus questions? They think they're going to catch him out. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So he knows the law. He's an expert in the law. He should know the law. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. Now that's interesting. Because what Jesus is saying, do this and you will live, is not that it is a works-oriented salvation, but the ability to love in the way that he is now going to explain comes from a supernatural birth that occurs and enables you to love like that. And it's expressed as such. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, let me read it. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell in the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went on his way, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to go down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So the priest, the equivalent terms today, the pastor of the church, walks down the road and sees the man lying there who's been beaten up, but he doesn't want to get his hands dirty. I don't want to get blood on me. Let me just walk on past. 
So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. The Levite who comes from the tribe of Levite, a, a, a someone who's part of the Levitical priesthood, he doesn't want to do anything either. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now we've got to understand the terms of reference here. Jews hated Samaritans. They were the dregs of the earth. There was this war of hostility that Paul talks about in Galatians that has been broken down through Jesus Christ. And the war of hostility he talks about is the hostility between Jews and Samaritans. Jews would have a prayer that they would recite, you know, I thank God I'm not a, a female, and then would go down the list and I'm not a Samaritan. There was intense hatred. But here's a Samaritan who sees a Jew, takes pity of him. He went and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took two silver coins, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after me, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you any extra expense you, have, you may have. And Jesus asked the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now let's put that into contemporary terms. When we think about our society now, and we try and think about the people who are most despised in our society, who are most hated. Those are the ones Jesus is saying we should love. Those are the ones he's saying we should reach out to. The people that society marginalize, the people that society ignore, the homeless on the streets, the beggar who, for whatever reason, has given up on life and sleeps on a street. I remember going in Brisbane uh, when we did food and a soup kitchen once a month, going into the center of Brisbane and meeting some of these homeless people, meeting a man who, when I got into conversation with him, I said, what did you do before you started living on the streets? He said, I was a science teacher at a school. And eventually, I just couldn't handle it anymore. Those people who society kind of pushes and doesn't want to know about. The criminal who's committed crime. And, G and James is saying to this church, you discriminate against these people. They walk into your church and you push them to one side. That's not love. Notice how James adds by applying the principle, does what is right in the eyes of God. In other words, the driving force and motivation to remove discrimination against one another is the love of Christ. That's what motivates us. It's not that we're doing this out of a sense of legalism. It's not that we're doing this out of a sense of trying to talk up ourselves and to tick the box and say, look how good I am. Look at, look at the way I treat those that other treat, people don't treat well. Rather, we do it because we love. Love drives us forward. In fact, Jesus goes even further, doesn't he, in Matthew 5, verses 43 and 44. What does he say in Matthew 5? You have heard it said, love your neighbor as yourself. But I say unto you, love those who hate you. Love your enemy. So who's your enemy? Who is your greatest enemy? Do you love them? That person who just makes life difficult for you, whether you're at school, at work, at university, at TAFE, a neighbor, maybe someone in the church, I don't know, that you kind of just make sure you, you steer clear of. 
Are we reaching out to them and extending love? And you see, when you put it in those terms, it makes you realize you can't do that on your own strength, can you? I don't have the power to do that. I don't have the capacity to do that. And so God, through the infusion of the Holy Spirit, enables me to do what I cannot do on my own strength. For he pours into me his own love. And that love has been expressed towards those who were considered to be his enemies. Once you were alienated from God. Once you were God's enemies, Romans chapter 5. But now you have been brought near. Christ demonstrates his love in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet in rebellion against God, God extends love to us by sending Christ to die. And that same love, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. That's radical. It's only possible with the grace of Jesus Christ. So when we see people with skin diseases, Disabled, it's not the right word today. Down syndrome. When we see people who are deformed in some way, some physical, some mental difficulty that they're struggling with. When we see people who just socially just don't know how it works. You know those people who stand so close to you that you're stepping back the whole time? Yeah, you know who I'm talking about. Those people talk funny. Maybe they've got a lisp or can't pronounce all their words properly. Do we love them? Secondly, Love's convicting power exposes discrimination. Love's convicting power exposes discrimination, verses 9 to 11. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Now the law he's speaking about here is still, in view of the context, the royal law of love. In other words, that love begins to convict you in the depths of your soul that when you start treating someone in a different way to the way you treat everyone else, that is not right. And the Holy Spirit brings that conviction to bear upon you. And there's a sense of feeling guilty for want of a better way of describing it. For whoever keeps the whole law, the whole law, talking about the royal law that covers all of the law, that overarches the entire law, and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. In other words, what James is saying to his readers is that it's no good to say, you know, I am pretty good at living in obedience to the laws that God has revealed in His Word. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't blaspheme. I don't swear. I don't lose my temper. I don't do any of those things. I'm pretty good at, at submitting to the, to, to, to the law of God as revealed in the Word of God. But when it comes to this matter of discrimination, well, it's not that big an issue, is it? James is dealing with some legalists in the congregation. And what these legalists are saying is, yes, but James, don't you understand? We're getting all the big things right. All the really important laws we're doing. We're ticking the box. And James points his finger back at them and says, it doesn't matter. You can get all the big things right, but if you're getting this one thing wrong, you've broken the whole law. You can't distinguish. You can't determine. You can't pick and choose. You can't decide what you want to obey and what you don't want to obey. No, when it comes to the law of God, it all matters. And to think that somehow we can 
say, well, I, I'm doing this okay and I'm doing that okay, but, but this one area, well, that's not so important. That's not so critical. I, I can deviate at that point and, and, and God's not going to really worry about it. I mean, I mean, it's not as if that I'm treating this person badly. I'm, I'm, I'm just not talking to them. I'm, I'm just ignoring them. I'm just pretending that I've got other conversations I need to be involved in and, and, and so I'm engaged in those conversations and, well, I just don't have time to get to them. But the Lord sees the heart. Some were trying to minimize the importance of what they were doing. But James would have none of it. He says to them, basically, you can't claim to be a law keeper if you're breaking one aspect of the law. You may as well have broken all of it. Now, when you think about that logically, when you think about our standing before God, and when you think about what it required for Christ to do in order to enable us to be reconciled to God, it wasn't the magnitude of the sins that we committed. It was the fact that we committed sin, period. And so it's not that somehow it's only the big sins that cause us to have to cry out for forgiveness from God. But it is the fact that we sin that we have to cry out for forgiveness from God. And it doesn't matter how minor that sin might be in the way in which we view it. But all sin separates us from God. And you see, this is the problem that an unbeliever has to grapple with, isn't it? Because the unbeliever says, as long as I live in a way that is mainly good, and as long as I do mainly that which is right, I'm going to be okay before God. And God says, no, you're not. Because none of you keeps the law perfectly. Not one. No, James is trying to stress the importance of the loving of neighbor as oneself. And in, <clears throat> assumed in that, the implication of loving your neighbor as you love yourself is the fact that not that we have self-love and we generate self-love. This is not a, a, a way in which we are being told that we should love ourselves, that we should go out of our way to love ourselves. Rather, what's being assumed is that you already love yourself, and you love yourself by the mere fact that you care for yourself. You put clothes on, you bath, you put deodorant on. I hope you do. You get a haircut. You stand in front of the mirror, especially if you're a, a woman, making sure that your hair's in place. Getting the makeup on right. You care for yourself. That's assumed. And so that is extended out. There's a great, I think I told this recently in the morning service of Robert Lee. Who it was said was a devout follower of Jesus Christ. And soon after the American Civil War ended, he visited a church in Washington. And during the service, he knelt next to a black man, remembering the Civil War had just come to an end. An onlooker said to him, How could you do that? And Lee replied, My friend, all the ground was level beneath the cross. So you may not lie, you may not cheat, you may not swear, but if you're not loving your neighbor as yourself, if you're not operating on the royal law of love, you've broken the whole law. So where do you and I stand in that? And that royal law of love then convicts you. Thirdly, 
Love's liberating power practices mercy. Love's liberating power practices mercy. Look at verses 12 and 13. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, when he says here, um, speak and act, in the original language, those verses are in the present tense. So what that means in Greek is that that is ongoing action. Notice the two aspects to that, speak and act. It's not enough simply to articulate love. You've got to act in ways that demonstrate love, and not just as a one-off, not sporadically, but in an ongoing way. And those two verbs are also in the imperative mood. It is a command. If I can put it like this, speak and act and do it all the time is literally what is being said here. And you need to act in accordance with those who ultimately have been liberated by the law, but who will be judged by the law of love. Liberated in what sense? You have been liberated from the power of the law. Christ has come. He has delivered you from the shackles of the law. No longer are you bound by that law. You have been given freedom in Christ. Now, in the light of that liberating power, and now in the light that you're no longer trying to make yourself acceptable to God by obeying different laws, now that you've been freed from that, shackled, have been broken from that, now you fall under the liberating law of love. Now you operate according to that law which frees you and enables you to love in a way that is not bound up in legalism. Because if love is motivated or if love is bound up in legalistic action, it's not love. Love comes from what we have received from God. It comes from the love that God has infused in us. And it is powered by God. And that frees us to love in the same way that He loves. By giving us a power that we do not have and a strength that we cannot muster up ourselves, given to us divinely by God. And that love then expresses itself in mercy. And he says mercy triumphs over judgment, and the reason he says that is to remind us that we should be very slow to make judgment calls on people. Mercy is much greater than judgment. Jesus deals with this in Matthew chapter 12 where he deals with the the Sabbath and the disciples picking the corn on the Sabbath and, and saying to them, isn't it greater that these disciples are able to experience mercy than simply for you to try and legalistically apply the, the law to them eating the corns of the leaves? No, no, no. You see, mercy is much more important. And it removes the quick judgments that we are so prone to make without having all the relevant information in our hands. Sometimes we form judgments by little bits and pieces of stuff that we have heard without getting the full picture. And we draw conclusions based upon an incomplete picture. James says, be careful. Don't be quick to judge. Be quick to show mercy. We see this so graphically demonstrated by Jesus, don't we? John chapter 8, verse 7. Remember the story? Jesus is dealing with this woman who's been caught in adultery. And they've brought her to his feet. And you know, for the, the, the Pharisees to do that, to catch her in adultery... It meant they had to be looking in the window. 
They had to actually physically see the adultery happening for them to make that accusation. And so they bring in, they throw to the feet of Jesus, and they say, this woman's been committing adultery. And Jesus says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, if anyone of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw the stone at her. And then he says to the woman, woman, where are your persecutors? And then she says to them, we're all gone. And he says to go and sin no more. Mercy. Now, by law, make no mistake, by law, she should have been stoned to death. That was the law. If you committed adultery as a Jew, they took you out outside the city and you were stoned to death, both you and the person you were committing adultery with. So if Jesus was to impose the letter of the law in that situation, then the death penalty was in view. But Jesus steps back from that because he knows the self-righteous attitude that these people are exercising in condemning this woman in the act of adultery is the issue here. It's not her adultery, even though what she's done is wrong. Jesus doesn't justify her adultery. But he's much more concerned with the self-righteous attitude of the Pharisees who are standing above and standing apart and saying, well, we're not like that. Look how bad she is. Now enact the law. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. If you're so perfect, you throw the first stone. Now let me ask you a question. Have you sometimes formed judgments about situations you've heard about or seen only to discover later on that with further information, it brings a whole new light on the situation. I've done it, to my shame. And I suspect all of you have done it at some point. And James says, he has your motivation, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. In other words, James says, don't forget, there is the judgment seat of Christ one day that you and I will stand in front of, and if we have acted in ways that are inconsistent with our faith and we have not shown mercy, we will stand accountable before God. Yes, there is forgiveness. Yes, where God's convicting power has come upon us and exposed where we have acted in ways that are not merciful and we have repented of that sin and we have asked for forgiveness of that sin and we have confessed it before God. Yes, there is forgiveness and we won't stand before God like that one day. But where those who have shown uh, uh, judgment without mercy and have never repented of that and have proudly stood in that judgment and have not moved on that judgment, God says they will stand before him and they will answer. They won't get away with it. Therefore, he says, if you exercise mercy, then you don't have to worry about that part of judgment because you won't be judged in that way. The principle is simple. Faith must result in works, and it expresses itself by allowing mercy to triumph because of love over forming judgments unnecessarily. It's so easy for us to form judgments, and yet, do not all of us need mercy? When I come before the throne of grace, before God, in the words of the hymn writer, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked flee to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul are to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. We are completely and utterly in the hands of Almighty God, and it is His mercy that is exercised towards us, not judgment that enables us to stand before Him. And on the cross in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see God's greatest act of mercy towards us in condemning His Son, in exercising His wrath against His Son. 
he is able to exercise mercy upon us and not treat us as our sins deserve. If that is how God has demonstrated mercy to us, ought we not to operate at the same level towards each other? Is our love expressed by giving each other a wide berth, by being slow to form judgments and quick to demonstrate mercy, particularly when we've been wronged and particularly to those people that rub us up the wrong way? You see, in God's kingdom, love is colorblind. Love makes no discrimination or does not discriminate against people because they're different to us. And in that environment, a church will flourish where that kind of love permeates a group of believers together, it will create the kind of church that will be compelling for people to come in because they will know from whatever walk of life they come, they will come into an environment where they will be loved. That story of that boy in Sunday school, and Moody tells it, and I'm just trying to remember it, of a young boy who would walk a long way to go to the church and one day when was questioned by someone, why do you walk such a long way to go to Sunday school to that church? And his answer was, because they love me. May that be true of this church. And may that be true of you and I. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for reminding us of the power of love. We know that we can't love just because we try and generate love, that that kind of love can only come through the inner working of the Holy Spirit who has shed the love of Jesus abroad in our hearts and causes that love to overflow out to all we come into contact with, without exception. So we pray that we would rest in the power of the Spirit and allow him to equip and enable us to love as Jesus loves, for your sake. Amen. Let's stand.